quite an adjective nowadays. When you hear this term, what do you think about? Uh, think about picking another job. <laughs> um, no, the, the answer is I think uh, you know, a very interesting presentation uh, from uh, Matt from, from BlackRock. And BlackRock is a uh, built a business largely on passive strategies and uh, you know phenomenal business. The vast majority of the capital markets today, the public cap capital markets, the investors are passive. Uh, you know they're indexed, uh, they're closet indexed, uh, they're indexed plus an alpha strategy. And if you look at the shareholder list of major companies, it's BlackRock, it's Fidelity, it's Cap Research, um, it's Vanguard, uh, and and by charter these institutions are passive. If you think about capitalism, you know, 100 years ago, it was very different, right? You had Carnegie, you had J.P. Morgan, you had uh, you know players who'd buy big stakes in businesses. They were control shareholders. There was an owner on the board of directors. So so capitalism over time has democratized, uh, which I think is great for accessibility to. Uh, you know, the average man in terms of investing in the market, but you, you get rid of owners uh, controlling uh, companies. And I think uh, what activists do is they're sort of, they represent other shareholders. You know, if you think back to a uh, friend, Mr. Icon, in the 80s, he operated very differently. Uh, today, uh, an activist shareholder takes a stake in a business and is only successful if all of the shareholders benefit. It's not green mail where the, the activist investor buys a stake, gets a benefit for himself and moves on. Uh, you know, if you take a stake in Canadian Pacific Railroad and other people follow you in and they vote in your uh, directors and a new CEO comes in and the stock does well, you know, the, the, the shareholders benefit collectively. So it's a, I think it's a very valuable feature for the market. If the shareholders don't support the activists, it never gets done. And we're not a control investor. We're a lead investor. We're leading the charge on behalf of other uh, shareholders. Actually, you're allowing me to segue perfectly to the next question. So when an activist or specifically you invest on the long side. Um, tell us about that first call to the C-suite because usually it means there's some change you're looking to do, whether it's board seats or strategy. And so, you know, what, what's that call like when you make it? Well, first of all, it's rare that we look for board seats. Uh, I'm on three boards today, but we've made uh, you know, 26 activist investments, I'll call it, and we've been on uh, four or five boards you know, over, so it's it's a minority of the time. Um, you know, I think it's uh, you know when I call, um, you know, we get a very you know open reception, and uh, we're dealing with very sophisticated CEOs and companies, and the vast majority of the time, uh, you know, we're in favor of you know, we like the business, we think it's undervalued. That's not a bad thing to hear as, as a CEO <laughs> of a company, and we have some ideas on how to, the business could be made more valuable. Um, it's rare that the idea is replace the CEO. Uh, that's not a call the CEO likes to receive. Right, right. But they know that there's change in the air when you're making a call. Sure, but I mean, look at Fortune Brands, right? We took a stake in the business in October of 2010. We sat down with the management of the company and we outlined why we believed Fortune Brands, which owned Titleist, a business called Fortune Brands Home and Security, uh, Jim Beam, why that consolidated uh, conglomerate made, uh, it was time for that business to be separated. And uh, we walked through the strategic logic you know, what's going on in the spirits industry, uh, why there are opportunities if you could have a standalone home products business, uh, and why it was probably time to sell Titleist. And uh, that was a qu in private, quiet meeting. Uh, we walked through an 85-page presentation. Uh, we asked management how long they would need to kind of think about what we had to say. They said, you know, give us five, six weeks. Five weeks later, they announced that they would be selling Titleist, spinning off the home products business. That stock was 40 the day before we started buying it. The pieces today are worth uh, $96 a share, uh, and it's two and a half years later. Uh, I've got a very appreciative phone calls from the, the, the management of the respective subsidiaries. You know, I think they love running their own businesses. Uh, you know, the, the, the CEO of the Spirits Company, you know, when the housing market was not in a good place, you could be doing a fabulous job selling Jim Beam, but still you're not, your stock options aren't worth very much. So I think right. it's, a, it's a positive development for the shareholders. I think it's very good for the management of the company. So are, are you intimating that when you make that call, they like that you're on board? Uh, I think the answer is perhaps there's some degree of concern of what we have, okay. might have in mind, but uh, in the vast majority of the cases, you know, people seem receptive to hearing what we have to say, and, and we're, we're not, uh, there, there's a full spectrum of techniques in activist yeah. investing. So most of your position's on the long side. When you go the other way to the short side, and we'll talk about one specifically, but do you then also make that C-suite call, or do you kind of do it in a different fashion? You know, uh, we, I did not call Herbalife <laughs> prior to making a presentation. Um, 
you know, in the case of MBIA, uh, MBIA you know, 10 years ago or more, we did sit down with the management of the company at least to hear how they were, you know, some answers to some questions we had. On mm -hmm. Herbalife, we were able to figure things out without meeting with the management of the company. Mm -hmm. So, tell us a little about your portfolio. Why so few names? Um, you know, obviously there has been some rumors of the performance uh, up 6% uh, for the first quarter. I know you can't say that's accurate or not accurate. With most of um, your portfolio up double digits, uh, one down double digits, which we'll talk about. But give us uh, just a take on why so few names and um, so for a bunch of reasons, I mean, I've always had the view that, uh, you know, why, why not own the best 10 or 11 investments as opposed to ideas 12 through 25 or 12 through 100, which is more typical. And, uh, you know, I think there are very few great investments at any one time. So the ability to concentrate is an enormously valuable asset of a strategy. Uh, the problem with it is most, uh, it leads to bumpier returns and it, it, it leads to uh, more attention on on mistakes or things that aren't going well. You know, I don't know a portfolio manager that doesn't have a stock that's down in his portfolio, right? But you don't read articles about, uh, I mean, we're getting an awful lot of attention for a pretty high profile situation that's, uh, that's struggling. Um, but I think there's, uh, you know, it depends on what your business model is. But if you want to make high rates of return over a long period of time, it's hard to do that being very diversified. I mean, if you, you look through the Forbes 400, wealthiest people in the world, um, most of them uh, made their fortune in one business or a portfolio of two businesses. Very few made it in a portfolio of a hundred. So it's, it's that and the other benefit it allows you to run a much simpler uh, investment firm. We have an eight person investment team. Uh, if we had 30 names we couldn't manage that portfolio the way we do with a small team. By there's, having a small team you can hire better talent. There's actually an argument that some people are now making that you know buying the index or buying diversified funds have had much better returns than buying, you know, those hedge funds that have, you know, a very specific smaller portfolio approach, like yours. Oh, I haven't seen that article. I mean, I think we've done very well relative to uh, any index alternative. Certainly. So I mean, I can, it depends on how you judge us. I think if you judge us on a 90-day basis, I have no idea how we're going to do relative to an index. But I think this is a strategy that, over time, should earn a meaningful premium over, you know, any kind of benchmark. Uh, or you shouldn't give us your money. Yeah. So talk to us about the Bill Ackman strategy or that mental checklist that you go through before deciding to go longer, shorter position. I mean, first of all, it's not a Bill Ackman strategy. It's a Pershing Square strategy. Pershing Square. And it's it, you know I do get a fair amount of the. Uh, but you the, have the final say, yay or nay. That's correct. Okay, so some could pick that. I'm as a CEO. A good, buck stops okay. with me. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. We uh, just want to make sure that the it's good not ones and the totally bad ones. management by committee. That's correct. Okay. So, but, but just to be clear, every idea has a leader at Pershing Square, so, and the leader so, may not be me. You know, so sometimes go, it's me, sometimes not. Go through that strategy and go through uh, how it works, and when you come, you know, maybe you'll override that portfolio manager or not, but what, what's the checklist you kind of go through? Uh, so we look for very high quality businesses, uh, what we describe as simple, predictable, free cash flow generative, dominant businesses, a, a business that Warren Buffett would describe as having a moat around it. Right? If, you, if you believe that the value of anything, financial, is the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life, well, you need to know what, how much cash is going to generate over its life. So, the, so business quality to us is the single most important uh, criterion for determining what's interesting. Because if, if we can't predict the cash flows, we don't know what it's worth. If we don't know what it's worth, we can't invest. So we figure out what it's worth, figure out how good the business is, how predictable will this cash flows be from a railroad or a spirits company or a real estate company, a shopping mall business. Uh, and then we say, uh, okay, well, where's the trading? Um, and if there's a wide gap between price and value, uh, you can buy for 50 cents, it's worth $1.20, well, then we're going to take a hard look and try to understand why it trades at a deep discount. And uh, once we understand the reasons, we decide, well, these things that we can solve. You know, or, or can we, in light of the situation, uh, the circumstances, can we be influential in changing these, these levers that can cause this valuation discrepancy to narrow? And is this a business that, while we're causing the valuation discrepancy to narrow, we can also perhaps contribute to the valuation growing? Uh, if those things are true, we found something that looks quite interesting for us. And um, usually this investment philosophy, does it take a week, a month, three months to do the research, a year? I mean, you have 10 names. What, how long? It depends. I mean, one of the best investments we ever made uh, took us four hours to do the work. 
Uh, it was during the financial crisis. Which uh, was that? Uh, Wachovia Corporation. Okay. So um, I was on my Blackberry uh, eating breakfast, uh, the Brooklyn Diner, uh, in front of my building. And there was a story went across the, uh, you know, just you know, re you know, Wall Street Journal headline, uh, Reuters headline, excuse me, uh, went across saying um, that Citigroup uh, to acquire the Wachovia banking subsidiaries for $2 in Citigroup stock. Stock was halted. This was kind of an interesting transaction because they were buying the subsidiaries for Citigroup stock. I figured, hmm, this is interesting. What happens to the holding company? So I went back to the, you know, kind of went upstairs to the office and, you know, cracked open the 10K and, and uh, another member of the team, Mick McGuire, uh, uh, he and I worked on it. And uh, what was interesting is the 1,000-page 10K of Wachovia Corporation, I think 900 pages were on the banking subsidiary. And there was fewer than 100 pages on the holding company. By buying the banking subsidiary, Citi was leaving a holding company which had cash, um, you know, in Wachovia Securities, uh, A.G. Edwards, they had paid six, seven billion for it six months before, um, Evergreen Asset Management, and they were taking a $27 billion uh, loss on the sale of the subsidiary. And uh, it, it also had a liability called non-cumulative perpetual preferred stock, which if you ever want to have a liability in your life, this is the single greatest uh, liability to have. It's a it's a form of equity where you never have to pay a dividend, and when you don't pay them, they don't accumulate. And right. the worst case is they get a couple of directors on the board, and you say hi to them each meeting, and uh, you have this very. And I said, look, this could be the, our, our Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, at the end of the day, we figured the asset. You know, in four hours, we determined the holding company was worth at least 11 to 14 dollars, cash, a tax refund that you could, you, know, you could carry back the 27 billion dollar uh, loss, recover cash taxes that have been paid. So you have this cash vehicle, you don't Wachovia Securities, which is a you know, good wealth management business. Mm -hmm. You don't A.G. Edwards, another interesting yeah. uh, asset. You, these are businesses you know well. And uh, the stock opened after it was halted at $1.84. So we said, look, it's worth you know, 11 to 14, $1.84. We bought 42% of the volume for the next four days. And then it was acquired by, then Wells came in and put in a topping bid of $7 in Wells Fargo stock, which wasn't actually a topping bid. But the Wells Fargo deal did not require government assistance. Right. So I think Sheila Bear liked that. Yeah, I remember that. Like that I actually better. interviewed Sheila Bear sure. for our show. Sure. So before we go into some of the investing uh, actually, ideas. Actually, could someone bring me some water? That would be great. Thank great. You. Maybe a bottled water. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you're known for occasionally hiring people with some non traditional financial backgrounds a former fly fisherman, a tennis pro, someone you met in a taxi. So what actually <laughs> are you looking for? So most of the people that we have on the investment team uh, are people with more conventional backgrounds. Uh, half the team worked at uh, Blackstone in either private equity or investment banking. Uh, a few guys from Goldman Sachs. Um, but I'm a big believer, you know, I had internships in my uh, life. And, uh, you know, if I meet a great human being, uh, you know, I want to give some, you know, people who didn't go to Harvard Business School and didn't work at Goldman Sachs for four years, you know, some exposure. So I met, at the beginning of Pershing, I met a guy named Oliver White. Uh, who I believe is one of the, you know, he's become recognized as one of the top fly fishing guides in the world. Very smart, interesting guy. Taught me fly fishing. And I said, look, if you're interested in business uh, and you want to uh, intern at, uh, you know, learn something about it, you know, come work for me. And uh, Oliver came and spent 18 months with us. Um, and you're taking a very outdoorsy guy and you're putting him in Manhattan, which is kind of an interesting uh, thing. He didn't like that part of it. But, uh, he learned a ton about business, uh, and then he left. Uh, he actually worked a lot on uh, one of our proxy contest situations. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Ceridian, we had a, a, a proxy contest. One of the issues was the, uh, uh, the uh, CEO was using the corporate jet to do a lot of fly fishing junkets. So yeah. we were able to track that stuff through his network of fly fishermen. So it was useful in the proxy contest. Anyway, um, and uh, Oliver left, uh, you know, to do a, and uh, I backed him to buy a fly fishing lodge, which is the Abaco Lodge in, uh, in uh, Abaco in the Bahamas. And it's like, you know, 20% unlevered return on capital, and he's done an unbelievable job managing it. And uh, we hired a guy named Mary Zadamski, who I met on the tennis court. Uh, super talented guy, went to Wake Forest, uh, you know, top tennis player. And uh, he, um, you know, I offered him a, a job, and he's worked for us uh, for the last couple of years. And he did a lot of the research on Herbalife. Uh, and he did a phenomenal job. Um, so I just, you know, he's going to go to business school because uh, he's going to, he needs more training to, to come back into the business. But I, I think it's a, you know, it's a I'm nice gonna, thing to I, offer people those kind of I opportunities. Know. Well, I'm glad I was I, offered opportunities like I'm that. I'm glad I flew down with you. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I have a role for uh, at Pershing soon. So now let's get into a little of the fun part. So you've been in quite a bit of news lately. I mean, I've had 30 ish interviews on impact players and actually researching you. 
I thought would be quite easy, but actually it's very difficult because you actually have to separate fact from fiction. Sure. It's become very difficult with you. I have to. I have I've to noticed be, that as well. I have to be honest with you, but um, you most notably. Depends what you think is fact, depends what you think is fiction. <laughs> exactly. I have my own version of that. Um, you've become most notably uh, famous for this public feud you've had with Carl Icahn, and I'm not going to get into that, other than. Um, do you feel like you underestimated how personal this fight over herbal life was going to become? And for someone that has been relatively a private guy and, a, 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 you know, an investor and really sticking to his business and his family life and how, you know, keep things separate, you now, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing Bill Ackman, whether it was a New York Times op-ed or this month's Vanity Fair. Or today on I thought Reuters. I bought up most of those Vanity Fair issues. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're still around. So, okay. I mean, you have to be surprised how this takes off. And how does it, you know, so does it make you second guess how you've kind of gone about this whole uh, affair? Look, short, taking a short position and going public with it is a pretty serious business. Um, we, uh, and I debated long and hard as to whether I wanted to do that again. Uh, you know, we, I took a lot of heat for taking a big short position in MBIA yeah. and, uh, and sharing my thinking publicly about why I thought that 150 to 1 levered AAA rated institution guaranteeing subprime CDOs is not good for America and not good for your pocketbook. Yeah. It could cause a financial crisis, by the way. Uh, and there's some similarities because you thought the regulators were missing that as well. And we did. And it took us a couple of years to get the regulators interested in taking a look at the accounting issues, reserving issues, and, and, and so on for the company. But I learned a lot about dealing with uh, the regulatory community uh, and also now a lot of headaches associated with it. Yeah. Uh, in the case of Herbalife, um, I couldn't really believe, I came to the conclusion that how can this company really exist? How is it possible that a $4 billion revenue business with a $7 billion market cap uh, is a pyramid scheme? Um, and, uh, but you know, how could Bernie Madoff have had $50 billion under management mm -hmm. in a pyramid scheme? Um, and I debated, do I want to go public with this? And uh, you know, the first part of that analysis is one, we've got to get to a level of certainty here that is higher than any other investment we've ever had. Because again, to come out and say a company's effectively violating a law is a pretty serious uh, accusation. Uh, we didn't want to do it on our own. You know, we hired one of the top law firms in the country who did six months worth of work and came to the same uh, conclusion and uh, agreed to uh, meet with regulators uh, with us, which I think was an important part of our, uh, the work we did. But still, do I want to go public and take the heat? Yeah. And the problem with short selling is it's still not accepted as a uh, particularly well accepted as an American way of investing. There seems like something inherently shadowy or evil about short sellers. Um, you look at some of the, uh, you know, David Ironhorn's call on Lehman, Jim Chanos's call on Amazon. We had Jim Chanos on, he's still talking about China. If, if uh, Lehman had done a recapitalization in response to David Einhorn saying they had inadequate capital, yeah. Lehman would still exist. And I don't know exactly what have, the, uh, the course of the financial crisis. We've still had a financial crisis, but probably not as severe. Um, had MBIA, in effect, recapitalized when we right. pointed out the inadequacy of their capital, you know, uh, municipal bondholders would have a better, would have a better insurer. In the case of Herbalife, uh, we concluded the risk reward was very attractive. We thought, it, um, by virtue of sharing our thinking publicly, pyramid schemes rely on deception. Uh, there are, they've got to recruit almost a couple, two million people a year to keep the scheme going, mm -hmm. and a growing number to keep the scheme growing. It's harder to do that when there's tremendous visibility about the business model. Uh, the company's been forced to update its disclosures that it's now sending to its distributors, and in fact, 88% of the distributors make nothing. They get no royalties from, from real life. That's not a fact that they were willing to disclose publicly before. They've been forced to shut down some of this uh, lead generation recruitment that happens on the internet, which is a completely, uh, the way it's done by their distributors is, we believe, totally in violation of the law. So just by virtue of going public, we mitigate the risk of being short because it affects their ability to deceive people, it affects the fundamentals of the company, and that mm -hmm. reduces the downside of being short, the stock price rising. And then we have the benefit of a potential regulatory But you catalyst. would never guess that. But, so all, that's the kind of thesis. Right. Now, did I think that a, a group of hedge fund managers would take the other side of the trade and, and uh, try to you know, orchestrate a short squeeze? No, right. I didn't think that. In fact. What I think is disappointing about that, and again, I, it doesn't bother me at all if someone takes the other side. Every investment we have, there's probably someone short, uh, things that were long, or obviously long, things that were short. That's how the markets work. Uh, what, what's sort of nice about the hedge fund industry is it was an industry where it was more a 
cooperative industry. I didn't right. view our, my people in the industry as competitors because we we'd find value together. You know, ultimately, right. you know, you see partnerships and various investments. This was the first case where a lot of sniping going on between yeah. managers, which I think is just a negative for the industry. Yeah. So I, I want to. Uh, so to quote you, if the FTC misses herbal life, it's the equivalent of the S SEC missing Madoff. So why have the regulators missed it for over a decade? So look, it's not an easy thing to be a regulator. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a job where um, you don't get a lot of awards for being a regulator. What, unfortunately, you, you get in trouble for missing things. Uh, you have limited resources, even though it's the government, they have limited right. budgets. Uh, companies have you know, uh, you know, lobbying organizations, they have uh, influence, uh, and they, you know, they, they push on the margin to minimize uh, regulation and oversight of their business. So they're, they're forces fighting against regulators. But what are you seeing so clearly that they are it not? It took us 18 months to do the work. We could spend an unlimited amount of money hiring the best lawyers in the country, we can put an unlimited amount of resources to figure things out. We could focus just on this one company, and we have no obligation to regulate the rest of the direct, mm -hmm. so-called multi-level marketing industry. We, just, we found one outlier. We spent all of our time and energy on it. We studied it, and it took us a very long time to get to a level of conviction and certainty that we could feel comfortable going public. A regulator can't do that. Um, uh, they just don't have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, uh, same thing on, uh, you know, in fact, if I were, if I were chairman of the SEC, I would have a regular meeting with Jim Chanos, David Einhorn, and all the best short sellers and say, what are your favorite shorts? So have you <laughs> sat down with the SEC giving them your presentation? Uh, I've been told that I'm not allowed to uh, answer, that. answer that question. But you, you should assume that uh, we're fairly proactive at Pershing Square yeah. and that we will meet uh, and have met with uh, a wide array of regulators that have jurisdiction right. over the company. So um, you have said that you'll donate any of the money that you might gain from Herbalife to charity. I should say as a side note, my wife is hoping you win because she's at the RFK Center for Human Rights and she's hoping that you win and then wants to sit down with you. Okay, but why have you decided that this is something that in some ways you're now giving to the charitable side? And we'll talk about your philanthropy, which has been really outstanding and not discussed enough about how much you've given back. But I, I, I mean, why are you making this case a little different than others? Look, I think the answer is, well, first of all, I'm philanthropic uh, generally. Uh, there is a taint associated with short selling. Uh, my experience with MBIA is every time we talked about or made a presentation about MBIA, people would say, oh, he only believes that because he's going to make a profit if the stock price goes down. And what's interesting is all day people go on CNBC and talk about stocks they like, and no one discredits them by virtue of the fact they're going to make a profit if it rises. But on the short selling side, there's something at least some people perceive it's inherently wrong with it. In the MBIA case, the stock basically went up for years. This, the credit spreads got tighter and tighter and the AAA rate, rating remained until one day I gave a presentation at, I uh, forgot which conference, and I said at the end of my presentation, I hereby commit to give away 100% of the profits uh, that I personally make from this investment. That was the high for the stock. It went straight down. The credit spreads went from 13 to 2,000. We made, you know, a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, I seeded the Pershing Square Foundation uh, with 140 million dollars from that uh, wow. situation. Fantastic. And, and we spent the money already, so we need to refill uh, the foundation. So, yep. in fact, we there spent 200 go. million on, on uh, charitable things, and we need, we're running out of resources. Yep. Yeah. So now on to uh, J.C. Penney. You own somewhere around 15 percent of the company, makes you the largest shareholder. Sure. The stocks dropped north of 20 percent this year. You've taken a bit of a hit. Uh, Sure. Both you and your investment in it. Um, why the confidence that you think this retailer can turn it around? I think we'll see. Uh, but uh, here's what we find interesting about JCPenney. It's a great brand. It's been around for 110 years. Um, by virtue of being around for 110 years, uh, JCPenney has 110 million square feet of some of the best shopping mall real estate uh, in the country. That's a great place to start uh, if you're a retailer. It has long-term laddered debt maturities over a very long period of time. Um, and it's a great platform, um, but it was really a, a, a retailer that was dying slowly. Uh, you know, it really peaked probably in the you know, late 80s, early 90s, and it's, it's been difficult from there. And the thesis was, if we can bring, you know, Mike Ullman was approaching retirement, 66 uh, or so years old, um, perhaps we can help recruit a top retail uh, CEO who can bring 
kind of a growth strategy to the company. And uh, we recruited Ron Johnson, and, he, and he's gone to work. And, it's, uh, and he's doing one of the most difficult uh, kinds of business turnarounds. I mean, Hunter Harrison at CP has done an unbelievable job uh, turning around a railroad, which is not an easy thing by any means. Yeah. But he doesn't need to change the business model of the railroad, right? You know, the revenue side sort of takes care of itself. Here, what Ron is doing is, you know, fixing the cost structure. They've taken, a, you know, something approaching a billion dollars out of the cost structure. Uh, changing the merchandise in the stores, changing the way the merchandise is presented. Um, if you had to, uh, no, the impact has been on a consolidated basis, something very close to a disaster, right? Sales are down uh, tremendously, sequential comps have declined dramatically, no business can survive uh, the, 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 the trend here. And he's working very aggressively with his team uh, to fix the mistakes that have been made. There have been some big mistakes. Uh, and I think one of the big mistakes was perhaps too much change too quickly mm -hmm. uh, without adequate testing what the impact would be. And, and uh, so, you know, again, I, as I've, you know, I've told our investors, JCPenney is the highest risk and highest reward investment in the portfolio. If you think about retail, just to segue for a second, yeah. um, the wealthiest people in the world are retailers in every country, whether it's the Waltons, in the United States, or whether it's the guy who owns IKEA in Sweden, or the uh, Indiglo, uh, you know, uh, Japan, uh, the, the Inditex in, in Spain, if you get a retailer fixed, if you b get a good model and you can replicate, uh, it's about the best way to make money ever. But it's not easy. It's hard. JCPenney has huge structural competitive advantages by virtue of its asset base, by virtue of its brand. Uh, it's a good place to start, but it doesn't guarantee success. And my guess you won't answer this next question, but when a stock's down roughly 25% and the stock market's gone up dramatically, um, at what point do you decide I'm going to buy more or at what point do you decide I'm cutting my losses? This is just the wrong direction. It has nothing to do with the stock price for us. It has to do with what's going on in the business. Uh, you know, in JCPenney case, we're on the board, we're working uh, hard uh, along with the other directors and you make sure that this ship is steered uh, is steered correctly um, you know it, as a general rule uh, you know we if we conclude that we're wrong or we've learned new f you know investing is about the best investments are the ones where we are the confident we're right and everyone else is wrong yeah. okay and you have to in order to be you know I've been accused uh, recently of being arrogant among well, other things. No, no, I'm going to actually ask you that. It was called, <laughs> it was pompous, but that's okay. Pompous? I don't, I don't think I'm pompous, but I've certainly been accused of being arrogant. <laughs> and there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. Yeah. If you're arrogant in investing, you're going to get killed, yeah. right? If you're not confident, you'll never make an investment, right? So you have to do a sufficient amount of work to be confident enough to have the conviction to do something that's contrarian, right? We bought the stock of a, uh, of a soon-to-be bankrupt retailer, I'm sorry, a shopping mall company during the financial crisis. Uh, at pennies per share. You have to be willing to look silly when you yeah. do something like that. Uh, general growth stocks up 90-fold since our uh, original investment. Um, you know, on, that's, we had confidence. Maybe people thought it was arrogant to believe that yeah. we could be successful in turning it around. Uh, but you also have to be humble. A and you have to recognize when there are new facts you hadn't considered that are inconsistent with your thesis. Well, if you look at Herbalife, none of the, the bull case for Herbalife, none of those arguments have, in our view, any merit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, we're we continue to have conviction. But if we were to learn a new fact that all of a sudden we realized Herbalife was a great company and it was, wasn't a pyramid scheme and the products really had tremendous efficacy and they were priced correctly and there was real demand for them, yeah. you know, we would change our mind. So, what, last question on JCPenney, but they've, their sales has been down 32% same store sales and you commented that the media has been very negative and CEO Johnson gets picked on more than any other CEO in the country. Do you really believe that criticism is not deserved? Criticism is deserved, uh, and Ron is working very hard. Uh, I, I don't know what the date of that comment is, but you know, look, uh, he's, this is a very difficult thing to do. Um, he is, uh, you know, I would say the ad hominem criticism, I think, is inappropriate. But yeah. look, he's a uh, the buck stops with him. He's CEO of the company. Uh, if it's failing under his watch, you know, he deserves, uh, and the board deserves, yeah. uh, responsibility for that. So. I'm pretty sure, I may be mistaken, that your entire portfolio is U.S. except for Canadian Pacific Railway, which may have been your best performer uh, last quarter. Um, why is this your only non-U.S. play? And do you think actually this may be a trend where you're starting to look um, outside of the U.S.? So we do very few things 
In fact, we do very few things a year. Right? Our average holding period is four or five years for our kind of active uh, investments, and we have 10 stocks. Right? We need to find a couple of ideas a year. It doesn't make sense to me, uh, unless the universe we play in, we've run out of targets. You know, why go, why fly to Europe? have a meeting with management, why you know, deal with a jurisdiction where we're less well known, where we have fewer relationships, we don't understand the legal system, the regulatory environment. So we focus on the United States and Canada. Um, we've invested in Canada uh, before uh, because we, you know, we understand the language, we understand the law, it's close to home, it's a short flight to uh, Calgary is next to a few hours, but uh, you know, it's just close to home. I can go see my kids. Do you tonight. like to feel and touch it? Yeah, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Um, so what has been your single biggest mistake you've made, either investing in a company or deciding to walk away from uh, investing? You know, we uh, spent an enormous amount of time looking at MasterCard before it went public. Uh, and I've always believed that, you know, I'd said previously, I was asked by, you know, at a business school by a student, what's the single best business in the world? And I said, if you could own a royalty on people spending money, like, Visa or MasterCard, it's the greatest business in the world. And if that ever became a public company, you want to buy that company, or if you ever could buy that company. Well, it became a public company, and we did an enormous amount of work on the company. We couldn't get comfortable with the regulatory risk. Uh, you know, there Consumer was a, Protection Agency, things no, there like was that. No, there was outstanding uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, antitrust litigation okay. relating to kind of monopolistic uh, practices okay. of, of the, uh, of the uh, Visa and MasterCard. And you know, when you have a strategy where you put 10, 15 plus percent of your assets in any one investment, you can't take even a very small risk of a catastrophic outcome. Oh, interesting. And so we passed on MasterCard, and it's been a, a, a incredible investment. Management's done an amazing job. That's a, that was, that's a big miss. Yeah. On the long, well, but it's, it's either, very interesting. It's either that, that I'm, one. The question is whether it's a miss. Right. Uh, did we did we overestimate the regulatory risk, or uh, or did it just work out in a reasonable yeah. way? So I think, you know, as a as part of a you know, 50 stock portfolio, we would have bought it. As part of a 10 stock portfolio, we couldn't do it. So, unclear to me, but I, I still look at that one and say, do we really have a miss there? Um, so, I'm sure you know you have some fans, some critics, and you've been described as pompous and needlessly competitive. Although I have to admit, I've been called worse in my own industry uh, okay. as well. Um, so tell me, how, would, how do you think that your peers describe you, and how do you think how do you think um, those that you invest in describe you? So in the last 90 days, I've had one very vocal critic. Um, uh, no. Actually, two. Really? Yeah. I don't um, think any of us have seen it. Uh, well, two. Uh, there's Carl. Uh, and then there's this guy uh, that I met, uh, money manager named Bob Chapman, who uh, I met on a panel seven years ago. We were on a panel together, shook hands never spoken to him since, I've never had an email correspondence, I've never seen him since, but in the last 90 days he's been running the talk show circuit on how I'm, you know, uh, you know either wrong or stupid or arrogant, uh, you know, giving quotes to Vanity Fair. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, I, I don't mind criticism, um, but I don't, I don't like reading things that are, I don't, you know, it, it's hard to read that. For someone who doesn't know me well to be commenting on what I'm like right. as a person, I find, I find that difficult. Um, but you know, whatever. I got to, you have to have a thick skin to be in this business. Uh, and um, you know, if you end up in a very public uh, uh, situation, you should expect to have uh, fans and critics. And you know, I just try to focus on you know, what my job is, and we focus on making money for our investors. And I live my life. And well, I want to talk about the side that I'm most proud about being your friend about, and that's what you and your wife has done. And so, uh, give me uh, a few seconds here. But you've been quite philanthropic. And in some ways, it's gone unnoticed because what's surprising is you are one of the youngest individuals to sign the giving pledge, which for those who are not familiar with that, it's giving 50% of your net worth away during the time you're living. Or more. Or more. Right. And in 2011, you and your wife, Karen, were among the list of philanthropies, uh, 50 list of most generous. And, and that's just great. And I think we all read the journal and everyone likes to read about the things, you know, that goes viral. But the truth is, um, you don't get enough credit for giving back. And I want to applaud you for that. I also want to get an understanding of, you know, why did you sign the pledge? And um, 
tell me about some of your foundation work that you and Karen are doing that's kind of true to your heart so we can get to know you away from uh, some of the other things we read. Sure. So, uh, my dad uh, was a very successful businessman. He's still, he's still active at uh, 74 years old. Um, and what's interesting about philanthropy is it's, I don't think it's innate. I think it's learned. And my dad always pushed me on how important it was to be charitable. And so I had the benefit of someone who provided real leadership uh, to me. You know, the obvious points are, uh, you know, I don't need anything else economically. My family's in a great uh, position. Uh, financially, I'm financially independent. I don't have those kind of concerns. So the question is what to do with the resources, right? You can give them to the next generation, uh, and there, you know, a lot of times it doesn't work out very well, right? I, I benefited by knowing, my father said to me, Bill, you'll never inherit anything from me, probably ever, or unless you don't need the money. Uh, and I, and, uh, and so I, I didn't have to worry uh, about that affecting my incentive structure. And I think that, you know, I, I had grew up, you know, one of my closest friends uh, was expecting to inherit a lot of money and it affected his ability. To, um, he was very talented, very smart, but he couldn't commit to anything and stick to it because he had too much optionality in a way. And so I think, um, you know, you can, you can create a lot of damage by handing, uh, you know, a fortune to, uh, to the next generation. And there are a lot more needier, more important causes. Uh, so give us a couple of the things that your foundation's involved with. So I'll give you who I think will get the Nobel Prize. Uh, seven, eight years ago, a guy came to see me named Andrew Yoon, and he, he had just started something called the One Acre Fund. And the One Acre Fund, he, young uh, guy, uh, moved to Kenya, I don't know if he was there just uh, on vacation or otherwise, and uh, met all these One Acre farmers. And these are women that, that support their families, uh, and you know, eight, nine, ten months of the year, they can feed their families based on what they can produce on the one acre that the government has given them. The other several months of the year, uh, they basically, their kids starve, and they starve. And through teaching modern farming techniques, uh, providing better uh, seed technology, better fertilizer, he's able to increase their output by 3x, and they have a surplus. And he provides the seeds and, and the, uh, the fertilizer and the, and the consulting advice in exchange for half of the excess increase in output. And he takes that money and reinvests it in another farmer. We've invested a relatively tiny amount of money with him, and we're his biggest funder, $7 million. By the end of this year, he will have taken something approaching 100, I think over 100,000 of these one-acre farmers from starvation to feeding their families to having an excess where they can send their kids to school. It's incredible. That's okay? incredible. And uh, you know, uh, uh, one of our members of our advisory board uh, you know, uh, was this former CFO of McDonald's, Matt Paul. He's helped Andrew in thinking about franchising, how to, how to build the system, and they're in Kenya now, and they're uh, going into Burundi, and uh, it's an incredible model. Um, I just look at a guy like that, wow. and uh, you know, my added value here was pushing him, okay, and uh, giving him capital to accelerate what he's doing. He's compounding. If this were a growth, I mean, by the way, he could make that a profitable business uh, if he slowed his rate of growth. But we've we've given him capital to, so he can do it more quickly. Well, so, I mean, stuff like that. I mean, you know, fantastic. Well, last stuff. last question because it's what is on everyone's Give money mind. to the One Acre Fund. So you can yep. find him online somewhere. I mean, certainly great work. So there are four teams left in the final four. We're going into the final four weekend. So we want to know who you would short and who you would go long. <laughs> um, and, and just to, so I know you've been busy, so I know you know who the final four is, but I'm just going to let you, you know. You have to prep me. Because that would really go viral if you didn't know who the final four is, so I'm going to tell you just in advance. Okay. You have Louisville, <laughs> Wisconsin, Michigan, and Syracuse. There's no Penn, there's no Harvard this year. Although you know Penn was the 79 team when Bird and Magic were there. I assume you went to, you went to Penn? I did, so I'm okay. just letting you know we made a final four once. But Harvard did have their, their first victory in the NCAA, so kudos to them. So who would you short? And who would you go long? I think short selling is risky. I wouldn't do now, it. You gotta, you gotta uh, have one. I picked Michigan because mom went there. Michigan to go long. I don't have a point of view. Okay. Then short, I'll, short, I, I only go publicly short if we really do our due diligence. All right, then I'll go Louisville to win. Okay. So I'm Louisville, you're Michigan, and we'll, we'll have a nice lunch again. Appreciate it. Well, I want to thank once again Partners Connect and Reuters for putting this together, and, and my friend Bill for coming uh, to do this today. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much.